I brought you a message about shadow dogs and how there are shadow people in the world. Uh, most of the dogs that come into our public shelters are not shadow dogs. Uh, a lot of them are healthy, socialized, they're ready to meet their new home, or they're ready to be reclaimed by their uh, previous owners. Uh, these are easy adopts, are easy to move into rescues, and no matter the emotional or the physical conditions of the dogs, I always am excited when one of them gets a new start. Not only do they get a new start, but there's an empty kennel that is too often immediately filled by another dog that needs a new start. Let us have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be a worthy fragrance in the world today. Amen. You know, however, there are dogs that come into the shelter that are injured or they're sick, and they need costly medical treatment that public shelters cannot provide. I'll always be stirred by these that are saved while other perfectly healthy dogs go overlooked. And yet I'm thankful when any are saved. I have been part of saving some severely injured or ill dogs. Uh, there is a state law that there's a mandatory 72-hour hold on any dog that comes in. They're not allowed to go out to uh, for adoption or to a rescue until that 72 hours is over with. Ingleside had, uh, excuse me, Seguin has a new uh, ruling of a couple of years ago that if a dog comes in with a collar, it's required five-day hold, and if it's microchipped it's required a 10-day hold. And during that time, the staff works very hard to find the original owner so they can return the dog. Soul came in to the shelter, emaciated. My first reaction was, wow, how could an owner possibly do that to a pet? And as soon as she was off hold, I immediately began contacting rescues. And I contacted Austin Dog Rescue, to, and they accepted her. This is a rescue that does not hesitate to take medically seriously uh, a serious dogs that are in need. However, they have to have a foster that steps forth to say, I'm going to foster this dog. Well, quickly a family did say, we will take this dog. And not only was Soul accepted, but I was allowed to be their friend and I could see Soul's progress. Soul's recovery was not easy. They had many different changes in food and medication. And it wasn't that she was being starved, but because of her genetics, she was her body was literally starving itself. And slowly they began to have the right combination of food and medicine, and she found a great home. They not only love her, but they have the means to keep her healthy. Then there was Gracie. Gracie was a little uh, female pit. She came in and the staff loved her, but they knew that she was beyond any help and she would never be adoptable. She was one of the many dogs, especially the pit breeds, that are used and abused in our society. The head officer asked if we could transport her to Luling to be picked up by this woman named Laura, who would take her to Dallas, where a group of women would be waiting to take her into a moray pit rescue in Oklahoma. Gracie had serious medical problems. She was heartworm positive, and the right side of her face was missing, and teeth were broken, because she had been shot in the face with 
the shotgun. While she loved humans, she was very guarded around dogs. Her heartworms were treated, she was spayed, and then a canine a dentist went to work. He cleaned up her mouth, removed the shattered teeth, removed the uh, pellets from the shotgun, and then he repaired her mouth. And her face looks almost normal. Gracie has quite a following, and if you want to see her on Facebook, just type in Gracie's Journey, and you will see what a great job her mom has done to uh, promote Gracie, the pit that is no longer in pain. And Mia, what can I say about Mia? This one is a story of an unbelievable village that worked to save her. Mia came into the village wearing a collar, which meant a five-day wait. When I saw her, I could, uh, could not imagine the pain that Mia was in. She was curled up in a ball in her kiln. She had a three-inch strip of hide missing down her back from her shoulders to her hips. There were marks on her head that were, that were red and, and bloody. I left the shelter hurting for this dog, knowing that she would be in that condition for five days. The next day I went to the shelter and I looked in on Mia and she was standing at the gate wagging her tail saying, please love me, please help me. I went home and posted her with a plea with Austin Dog Rescue. Not only did Austin Dog Rescue respond quickly, but a ready foster that happened to be a vet tech said, I will take her into my home. Others who were rescuers had put in their request for their dogs, and when they saw Mia, they said, take care of this dog from Seguin. Put ours on hold. The village was working. The next day I went to the shelter office and announced that Mia had a place with Austin Dog Rescue as soon as she was on hold. The acting head officer said, stay right here, I'll be right back. She met with the shelter supervisor at the police station, explained the situation, showed him pictures of Mia, and explained that the dog was still on hold. She returned and she said, he has approved her early release and Mia was on her way. There were biopsies sent to A&M Veterinarian School. It was determined that she has multiple bacterial infections. She also had the huge burn on the back of her uh, that was from extreme heat. We, can't, we don't know how it was done, we just know that it was really extreme. Mia went through months and months of treatment. The uh, foster would take her to work with her, uh, would bathe her and wrap her in a honey uh, ointment. And she stayed like that for months. Well, she changed from a hurting young dog into a large, strong adult. And the vet tech said that she was a loving handful. <laughs> Mia needed someone who understood and was willing to continue her training. Mm -hmm. And here Mia is with her mom. All decked down in the Halloween of last year. Now would someone, why would someone adopt a dog that will always have such a huge scar? Well, the lady saw Mia's picture, heard Mia's story, and she was looking for a pet that had overcome a great injury and would always bear the scar. For you see, Mia's mother had breast cancer.
and would always carry a scar. And so there's an instant bondage, bonding. Uh, there were so many people in Mia's village. The officer who found her, the lady that adopted her. One of the village people in Gracie's story is no longer with us. As Laura received and delivered Gracie, Laura was fighting her own battle with cancer. But others with her spirit and her energy are out the world working in dog rescue. Soul's village was a bit smaller, but was still vital to her survival. Every one of these people and so many more believe that they can make a difference and act on that belief. You know, we're called to be a village for people in the world, for our world is hurting. Christ commands us to be in the world, tending to the needs of others, and taking care of his creation. The good news is that we have to do something, but we don't have to do everything. Because see, we are part of the body of Christ. And together, we can work together to be the whole body. And to that I say to God in glory. Amen. A century or so ago, large sailing ships crossed the oceans and they carried cargo and they carried passengers. And there were large numbers of sailors that required to handle these massive sailing vessels to keep them afloat. The men that worked on those boats were divided into watches, into groups, first watch, second watch, third watch, etc. And when the first watch was on deck working, well, the other watches, they would sleep, they would eat, play cards, do other things. And when the first watch would complete their, their assignment, they would go off watch, the next watch would come on duty, and the cycle would continue. The sailors would rotate their duties. Now, as long as things were simple, a simple rotation would work. But there were those moments, those times when extra help was needed. There were those moments when the ship was struggling and the captain might have to call below for the second watch to come on deck. The first watch was on deck, but the danger was so great that extra help was needed. And so the second watch would be called up. And if it was so bad that even more help was needed, the call would finally come out at one point along the way, all hands on deck. All of us have heard that phrase. All hands on deck means <coughs> the captain needs everybody to respond. Everyone is needed. Rescue groups like the ones that Darlene works with understand that concept so very well. And so do your businesses. And so do your homes. And so do your schools and your churches. You know that concept. You know that there are times when only a few workers are needed, but you know there are moments when many workers are needed. People with a variety of skills are needed. I remember a staff meeting we had just recently, and we're getting ready to have a, the district-wide youth rally on this campus, April the 1st. Think about that, the youth rally on April Fool's Day. <laughs> Anyhow. And I can remember sitting in the staff meeting and uh, our youth director, Pam, making the comment. Yeah, she said, April the 1st, that's going to be all hands on deck. It means there's going to be a lot of work to do. The Apostle Paul understood this concept, this principle, and he realized that not everyone had the same skill, that not everyone had the same gift. In fact, is just prior to that passage I read to you today from 1 Corinthians, he's got the folks squabbling and griping and about whose skill is the greater. Well, I, you know, trying to prove that the ear is, you know, more important than the nose. And he was reminding his church, and he reminds us that each person is vital, that everyone has a skill that is needed, and that no one is more important 
than another. Mia, that last dog in, in Darlene's presentation, needed so much attention if she was going to make it. And an unbelievable chain was formed to rescue that dog. Some were on duty, but just for a moment or two. Others were on duty for several days or several weeks. And some were in it for the long haul. There were those that provided transportation, those that gave funds to pay for the gas for that transportation. Some donated their medical expertise. expertise. Others analyzed the lab results at College Station. All were vital. And it was the work of the village that made it possible for her to survive. You, Ron, all of us, we are part of a village. And it's a very special village. We are followers of Jesus. We are the people of the way. People who have committed ourselves to work walking in Jesus' footsteps. To do what Jesus did. To love the way Jesus loved. To serve others the way Jesus did. Pastor Andy served uh, the United Methodist Church in, in Bastrop before he came to Seguin. Remember those devastating fires that hit the the National Park State Park there a few years ago. It was a tough time. And it was a time when there were so many hands needed. And so many did respond. Our church, First United Methodist Church, we did our part. I remember that morning that the fires broke out and began to spread so badly. And how people would, were calling the church, offering to help. And people were asking they didn't call asking, is our church going to do something? They knew we were going to be on duty. They were asking, what are we doing and how can I help? I remember one person called the church office and said, hey, I'm retired. I've got a truck and a trailer and if you need me for anything, just let me know. We were on the phone talking to the district's office uh, in Austin. And they had supplies going out to the scenes. Plenty of water was available. But you know what we had just done here at First Church? We had just finished one of our hygiene product drives. We had toothpaste and shampoo and soap and lotion at the ready. We had already had it bagged up. And our shelves were full. Those products were needed. And we had a driver with a trailer itching to get out. I remember within two to three hours after we talked to the district office, that trailer and that truck were headed to the area with all of those. Maybe you brought a tube of toothpaste. Maybe you helped carry the collection baskets to the assembly area. Maybe you were one of the volunteers that that bag the supplies. Maybe you were one of the volunteers that helped box them up for us. Maybe you were one of the ones that helped load it onto the trailer and maybe you were the one that drove it there. Regardless of the part that you played, you were part of the village that day doing its job, a job that made the, a difference for the people, some people that we will never meet. I don't know what God has planned for our church next week or next year and maybe we'll be moved to drill another water well somewhere or to expand our feeding ministry perhaps we'll be urged to assist the refugees on the border or join hands in getting a shelter built for the homeless of Seguin I don't know what it will be but I do know this there will be a moment there will be a moment next week next month next year when a call will go out we need all hands on deck and when it does I'll see you on deck Amen? Amen. Amen We are the followers of Jesus and they were originally called the people of the way I love that we are the people of the way let us stand together as the people of the way and affirm that which we do believe